So welcome to today's webinar. Um, this is our fourth series of web fourth Friday afternoon webinars. We are excited to have you join today to discuss caring for the caregiver. If you haven't joined us so far for our Friday webinars, welcome. We've um, held three so far and we'll be continuing to hold more this month and next month. And if you've joined us already, thank you for joining again. And we are excited to have you back and welcome your feedback at the end of the session about um, future webinar topics. So just a quick background about our organization, the Myotonic District Foundation, also known as Myotonic, is a nonprofit organization founded in 2007 by families with myotonic dystrophy searching for support and a cure. Our mission at Care and a Cure is to enhance the quality of life of people with myotonic dystrophy and accelerate research focused on treatments and a cure. And we focus on support, education, research, and advocacy. So in terms of our resources, you may already know this, so hopefully a quick refresher, that we have a variety of toolkits and publications available on our website at our toolkits dash publications page. We have a lot of great virtual support groups and Facebook chats available on our find support and calendar page. We've actually added a few more for this month and next month special specifically Facebook um, chats. And so we hope you can join us for those. And we have a new exciting event of Friday afternoon happy hour hosted by Mindy Kim. Um, and you can find that information on the website as well. Our Digital Academy has a lot of great presentations and videos from past conferences and events. So check that link out too when you have a chance for some um, great information in our archives. In terms of resources, we wanted to make sure that you know we have two brand new resources available. The first is the Employment Access Toolkit, which is a toolkit that helps individuals navigate the employment process and includes information on how you can apply for a job and assess your readiness to work and everything that goes into that process. So take a look on our website if you would like to view the digital, digital copy. We also have hard copies available so that we can mail you if you'd like. We also have another great resource available, the Health Insurance Kit Considerations for People Living with Myotonic Dystrophy. And this is another guide, a navigational guide that will help you understand medical coverage, medical treatments, and anything else you're struggling around with the medical appeals and claims process. And that's available on our website as well for download. If you aren't already aware about our DM Family Registry, please take a look. The information is all on our website, our DM uh, myotonic.org. Um, so my, dot org slash myotonic dash dystrophy dash family dash registry. And this is a great a way for you to share your information, um, whether it's yourself or your families about your um, diagnosis. And so that you can share the information with researchers and other um, professionals who are trying to look for a cure. And um, you do have access to this information as somebody as a part of this database. So you can look at the data here as well. So please consider signing up if you haven't already. Just a quick plug for the rest of our webinars. Um, we have a lot of great webinars coming up, especially because we already added three new webinars. We have virtual chair yoga next week. And then the week after we have a new uh, webinar called Beyond ADL, Strategies for Life Modification, Socializing and More. And this will be um, presented by an occupational therapist who is very well known to our community, Dr. Cynthia Kenyon. And she will discuss ADL assistance, especially in the age of COVID-19. So we hope you can join for that. And then the following week, we'll have gene editing for DM, then exercise for, for the DM community. And then brand new, we have added two new webinars, one on Friday, June 12th, which is about myotonic dystrophy and the brain for um, myotonic dystrophy type 2, and the multi-systemic aspects of, um, uh, I'm sorry, those should be reversed. On the, on the 12th, we have the multisystemic and cognitive effects of myotonic dystrophy type 2. On the 19th, we have myotonic dystrophy and the brain. And all this information is on our website, and we will be sending out a reminder and communication next week to let you know about these webinars, as well as our past webinars are all available at the Friday afternoon webinar series link. So take a look. And then next Friday, we hope you will join us for the gentle chair yoga session with Ellen Shapiro. Ellen is a very experienced yoga professional, and she has led workshops and classes at our conference and in the community around accessible yoga. So we hope you can uh, join to get some, hopefully some movement in and some relaxation, building flexibility and strength. No yoga experience is needed or equipment is necessary. 
And here is on the screen is the link to register. And last but certainly not least, we also want to remind you about our food preparation for the DM community cooking video conference, which we premiered last week. This is our food preparation contest where we hope you will show up, show up your skills and share your, your skills about cooking. And um, so the basics of the, the contest are to create a five minute or less video about with a, a meal or a recipe that you uh, are, are skilled at making that shows an easy for to prepare dysphagia friendly meal. And so you'll identify the ingredients in your meal and um, you'll make a quick video of yourself. And so Leslie Krongold has graciously um, helped us with this and she is hosting some tech sessions next week to help you understand the process and also the week after. So we will be posting the information about those tech sessions on our website soon. And also we've extended the deadline for this contest to Tuesday, May 26th. So you do have a few more weeks and we really, really hope you'll um, consider in joining and, and submitting an entry and there will be prizes. So um, please take a look when you can. So on today's speaker, we are very, very lucky today to have caring for the caregiver, a very important topic in all times, but especially during the time of COVID-19. Um, our speaker today is Valerie Ochoa. And if you have questions during the presentation, please type them into the chat box of GoToWebinar, and I will provide them to our speaker at the end of the presentation if we have time. If, you're, your, if your question isn't answered, we will do every effort we can to get you an answer um, through email. So um, I'd like to, like to introduce Valerie, Valeria, excuse me. Um, she is a community educator for the Southern Caregiver Resource Center, which I recently learned is one of the biggest, if not the biggest, um, caregiver resource centers in the country. So they have a lot of great resources. You can see their link here at caregivercenter.org. Um, Valeria travels all over San Diego County to hold classes, bilingual classes and training sessions and workshops for her community. Um, and caregivers. She has an extensive background in public health and working with diverse communities and um, background in health disparities. And she educates and empowers communities and connects individuals to the services offered at this resource center. And so we actually had originally reached out to the center because um, we wanted them to present at our San Diego conference in the fall. But unfortunately, since we're not able to hold that until next fall, um, we hoped we were very happy that they were uh, able to present this information to us ahead of time. So without further ado, I'm going to just pass the wand over to Valeria. So just... Hi everyone, my name is Valeria Ochoa. Um, hopefully everyone can see my screen. I'm going to start the presentation. I'm here, as Leah mentioned, representing Southern Caregiver Resource Center. Um, we're very happy to be here. We thank Leah very much for the opportunity. We know that, yes, unfortunately, due to COVID-19, we had to, or she had to cancel her event, but now we're here adapting, doing things virtually. Um, I wanted to let you know real, really quickly what Southern Caregiver Resource Center is about, or SCRC for short. Sometimes our name can be a mouthful to some. We were established as a nonprofit organization in 1987. So almost 30 years plus later, we become the leading nonprofit organization that offers free resources to family and caregivers. So hopefully people like you, maybe you know um, some caregivers or maybe you've been a caregiver yourself. Um, the topic for today is going to be caring for the caregiver. It's one of our most highly requested and popular topics. So I'm very happy to be here to tell you more about it. So, so let's get started. The learning objectives for today is going to be that you're going to identify what it is to be a caregiver. Surprise, surprise, not a lot of us and not a lot of our caregivers know what a caregiver is. They think that a caregiver is a nurse working at a hospital. And most importantly, they don't identify themselves as caregivers. And I will talk more about it um, as I continue through my presentation, but we will identify the term caregiver and what it is. We will recognize the challenges that come with the caregiving role because it's not easy to step onto the caregiving plate. We're going to find ways to get the support that you need as a caregiver. And finally, we're going to incorporate self-care because this is something that's very, very, very important. As caregivers, sometimes we give most, if not all, of our time and affection to our loved one, the care receiver. 
So during this time, especially now during this time of self-isolation, we need to incorporate self-care. And I'm going to talk about this more um, towards as I proceed towards my presentation. If you have any questions, feel free to take, um, jot them down, take any notes, and just write them and type them in the chat box, and I will answer them at the end of this presentation. I'm trying to have a conversation virtually with everyone on the other side of the screen, even though that's not possible. Um, I'm trying not to make it so mechanical. Um, so let's talk about what it is to be a caregiver. What's the term, the caregiver, when you Google it and you search it on your search bar? The definition is a caregiver is a person who provides direct care. So it's a person who provides care. It could be your spouse caring for you. It could be a parent caring for their children, their loved ones. It could simply be a friend caring for their neighbor. A caregiver is essentially someone who loves another person and does caregiving, does the caring. So this is a, the word caregiver is highly diverse. Anyone can be a caregiver. We don't walk around on the daily basis saying, oh, I'm a caregiver. We say, I'm so-and-so spouse, or this is my mom. I am her daughter. I am his daughter. But we don't say, I am my mother's caregiver. It's a word and a term that's not commonly used and that may have some stigma to it. But ultimately, caregivers are people like you and me. A caregiver is everyone and everywhere. So I want to share this very famous and popular quote by the First Lady Rosalind Carter. It's one of my favorites. It says, there are four kinds of people in this world. Those who have been caregivers, those who currently are caregivers, those who will be caregivers, and those who will need caregivers. Now, my favorite part about this quote is the last sentence, the last statement, those who will need caregivers. And we really think about this and take a few seconds to take it in. We're all going to need caregivers at some point. From the moment that we're born, we have caregivers, which are the person who's nurturing us, caring for us from the time that we're born. They're everywhere. So. Let's face it, the caregiving world and the caregiving role is very, very, very important in our lives and will always be. So what are the different kinds of caregivers? Of course, like everything in life, there's many differences. There's a full-time caregiver, a part-time caregiver, and a long-distance caregiver. But what's the difference between these three? Well, the first difference is that the full-time caregiver is with their loved one 24 7. That means at all times, every single day, they live, might live together and they're caring for their loved one in the sense that they're helping them with activities of daily living, cooking, bathing, entertaining them, helping them with a bill 24 7. This is the full time caregiver. Now, when we talk about the part time caregiver, the part time caregiver is still a caregiver, but they do it part time. So this means that they go to their sister's house who is caring for their mother, or the primary caregiver. They go to care for their loved one two or three times a week. They're not with their loved one 24 seven, but they're still caring for their loved one. So the similarity is that all three of these do caring. Now for the long distance caregiving, I wanna give a really quick example. Here in San Diego, we're located in San Diego primarily. We had a very, very big event, which was a play. We decided to think outside of the box, but we decided to coordinate a caregiving play here in San Diego in a very popular theater. So be a day before the event, I went out and I was advertising. I was passing out flyers, trying to raise awareness about what caregivers do and the importance about this caregiving play and to raise awareness. I stumbled upon a man that came up to me. And he asked me, hey, can you tell me more about your organization? So I did. At the end of the conversation, he told me, you know what? This is really, really great. I think my sister who lives in New York and is caring for our mother would really, really benefit from this. She does all the work. Sometimes I travel up to New York to help her out. I know that I can't do that all the time. So I help her with the bills here from San Diego electronically. I do all those things, but I try to go see my mother whenever I can. Um, and I told him, oh, you know what? 
you're a long distance caregiver. And he said, no, 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 no. I'm not the caregiver. That's my sister. My sister does all the caregiving. So <laughs> that comes to show that a lot of people don't identify as caregivers. And this, this is a perfect example for what a long distance caregiver. Now, if you're a long distance caregiver, you don't have to be necessarily on the other side of the country. You could be in a different city, in a different state, or you just don't have the means and the transportation to get to your loved one's home and see them all the time. So that makes you a long distance caregiver. And the beauty of all these different types of caregivers is that they all do the same thing. They do equally um, and equally amount of work and their work is just as important as the other one because they're all doing it for love for their loved one. So what are the various roles that caregivers have? You might be thinking yourself to yourself, oh, what don't I do? I do everything. And yes, as caregivers, we have to learn how to do everything. If you weren't a good cook well, or you didn't cook as often, now you are because you're cooking for your loved one. Um, you drive your loved one to doctor's appointment. You help them um, make, you help the doctor make medical decisions. So you have to make these hard decisions. Um, and you're bathing them, showering them, you're changing their clothes, you're with them, and you have these various roles of caregiving. So you become the cook, the care manager, the insurance advisor, the accountant. Um, our caregivers don't think that their roles are very important, but as you can see, they're very, very, very important in our activities of daily living. And all of this can be very, very hard. So now what? I've identified and the term what caregiver is, what do caregivers do? What are you supposed to do as a caregiver now? What's the thing to do next? What's the next process? Well, we need to prepare more and recognize that there may be challenges as a caregiver. caregiver. So these challenges can be that we may feel unprepared at times. You may feel untrained, unworthy to be the primary caregiver, part-time caregiver, or long-distance caregiver. And with this, we may face frustration with the situation. That's a very big one. Lack of support from our family members, from our friends and loved ones, lack of understanding. And more than likely, we will have to make those painful choices that I talked about. And all of this can take us on an ongoing emotional toll. All of these challenges. We could have feelings of guilt because we may feel like we're not doing enough, because we're not the right person to do it, because we may not understand our loved one. And ultimately, this is a caregiving experience. All of the challenges, all of the tasks that we face on a daily um, basis are part of the caregiving experience. You have your loved one to take care of, and you still have your own responsibilities outside of your caregiving role. But most importantly, it's important to balance it all. I know this is easier said than done. The balancing act is not easy at all. <laughs> it's always easier said than done. But it's important to find a balance because if you do have children, you need to find a way to um, coordinate all of this and how do you make them happy and coordinate your employee responsibilities, organize these. You, have, you may have marriage challenges. You have a household to maintain, all while focusing on self-care, personal time, and your caregiving role. So this can be very, very tough. Ultimately, I don't know about everyone else, but as a caregiver, this is how I feel most of the time. Um, the inability to balance all of these responsibilities and challenges leave us feeling like this, like in this image. We feel stressed out, especially right now during this time of social isolation. Some of us may feel um, like we are stuck in, stuck in a box in our home. Like we, we can't go out. We can't go for a fresh of air, fresh um, breath of air. Well, we can. We can step outside, but we can't go out and do the things that we used to do. So now we're with our loved one during this self-isolation and we feel stressed out. And it's normal to feel like that. And the signs of stress are very diverse as well. We have physical stress. We have emotional stress, behavioral stress, and finally, social stress. And physical stress, we all know it. You feel it all over your body. 
your shoulders might be hurting one day, your knees might be aching, you have back pain, you might feel like you can't move as fast as you did before, and this is physical stress and aging as well. Um, you may have changes in your sleeping habit and loss of appetite, or maybe you may be eating more. This is all physical stress that um, can be caused by your caregiving duties, and something needs to be done about it. You also have emotional stress. You may lash out on your friends, your family members. You may lash out on your loved one, the care receiver, the one that's receiving your care. You may feel sad, angry, may have an outburst some of these days. Um, mood swings, anxiety, maybe you might feel empty on the inside. And th these are all signs of stress. I'm just mentioning um, a couple. You have behavioral stress as well. Behavioral stress can ultimately lead us to make um, unhealthy lifestyle um, decisions like the use of drugs and the excessive um, use of alcohol. We may have a low productivity. We may find that we're not as productive as we used to be. And also, as a caregiver, you might find yourself overreacting or forgetting a lot of things. This is all behavioral stress. And finally, social stress. During this social isolation, social distancing, COVID-19 pandemic, this is a big thing that's happening, um, that's occurring worldwide, and that everyone is feeling social stress. We may feel socially isolated. So you might be thinking to yourself, well, whoa. I can't, we're on a quarantine. I can't do anything about it. What can I do to stay socially connected during this time? Well, answer to you is that thankfully we're living a generation where technology is um, constantly developing, growing. So we can virtually connect with our friends and loved ones, family members virtually. We can get together and do book readings virtually. We can get together virtually and um, play games virtually as well. I do that with my friends and family to stay, keep myself busy and to stay socially connected so I can avoid having some of that social stress that can develop. Now, this is bad stress. We all know, or maybe not, um, that there's different kinds of stress. There's bad stress and good stress. Good stress may motivate you to do better, may challenge you, but this is bad stress. Now, if you find yourself in stress, um, all the time and stress is the state of mind that you're in every single day, then it's time to do something about it. We need to, and again, this is easier said than done, accept that there are things that you cannot change. Now, this is a very, very, very challenging thing for some of our caregivers, including myself, because sometimes you realize that you don't have control over everything like you want to, especially myself. So we do need to change our mindset into a more positive one and upset that you can change the way you approach them. Again, I know this is very difficult, but we can't keep swimming against the tide like many of you are. We have to go with the flow and facilitate things for ourselves as caregivers, as human beings, to try to focus on ourselves and do what's best for both of us for both you and the care receiver, your loved one. So what are the next steps? The next step is to develop a care plan. Here at SERC, we do this a lot for our caregivers. The first step is to increase our knowledge as caregivers. Now, this might sound like a cliche to some, but I use it a lot. I say that knowledge is power. Knowledge will make you stronger and will help you handle difficult situations better. The more you understand about the caregiving situation, the, your loved one's diagnosis, the condition, the options that are better for you, you will be able to respond more effectively to your loved one during difficult situations. So ask your doctor more about diagnosis, their dietary changes, their behavioral changes during the day and at night, and what is to be expected and what is not. All of this can help you understand your loved one's condition better. Then with this, you will become a better caregiver ultimately. And then you might be less inclined to react ne negatively to your loved one when things become hard or they have a behavioral out outburst. Then it's normal. Two, we need to identify the behavior. 
So what happened before and after your loved one's behavior? Maybe they developed confusion. Maybe they became agitated, anxious, depressed. What happened before and after the behavior? So you might want to have a notebook to record the different kinds of behaviors that your loved one has and when it happened and what time during the day did it happen. So if your loved one, for example, <laughs> a popular one that I hear a lot, um, if your loved one is having a difficult time sleeping at night, for example, they may become agitated at night, then maybe he or she is sleeping a lot during the day. Um, try dimming down the lights um, so your loved one can sleep better at night. Uh, if you have the lights on full blast during the day and you turn it off as soon as they go to bed, then that might not help them. So three, if that doesn't work, try a different response. Try a different plan, try a different approach. Always keep, with this, always keep your goal in mind. Your goal is to help your loved one. Your goal is to help yourself as well. So if dimming the lights one hour before going to bed didn't work, maybe try dimming it three hours before going to bed to, for your loved one. So maybe that way he or she may sleep more effectively throughout the night. And if it doesn't work, again, try a different response. And four, um, ask for help, <laughs> ask for help. This is really challenging for some. It's very humbling to do. I know that a lot of times caregivers may be feeling guilty, but just with the thought of asking help, they might feel like they're a burden to others if they ask for help, or they also may feel um, that it's a sign of weakness. Um, I know that these are things that go through my head when I'm, I'm thinking about asking for help for, so, for someone and that uh, I need the support. But all of this is essentially, again, personal barriers that we're putting in front of us to prevent us from getting the help that we need for ourselves and for our loved one. So what are other personal barriers that com caregivers commonly tell themselves or they tell to us, to SERC, is that they tell us, I'm responsible for my loved one's health, or I'm responsible for my parents' health. If I don't do it, no one else will. And I'm expected to do things right. No one else can do it better than I can. Or I promised my father I would always take care of my mother. These are all personal barriers, but they're very, very common. And these are things that we tell ourselves all, all the time. But we need to um, push these per personal barriers out of, out of the way to help ourselves, because if not, we're going to go on an emotional vortex, which is part of the emotional stress. We may feel frustrated. We may feel angry resentment, guilt. We may be happy at times, but sometimes loneliness can kick in, isolation, maybe the fear of rejection. And this emotional vortex, again, is an ongoing cycle that continues and continues every single day. And if you don't get the help um, that we need as caregivers, because we know that we have a support group, we have people that can help us, and we need to take it. Um, because that's the best way that we will become stronger. And I know that, again, it's easier, always easier said than done. But think, think about it. If you don't ask for help, then who's going to ask for help for you? No one else is going to do it because we need to speak up and say it for ourselves. So we, oh, we know I have that friend and I know everyone else has that friend that or individual that comes up to you and says, Hey, if you ever need anything, here's my phone number. Here, text me, shoot me a call. Let me know if you need help with anything. And we just um, put their phone, phone number away. We keep it in our archives, on our phone, on our contacts, and we never contact that person after they let us know that they, they're offering our help. We never contact them. We never know, let them know that we need help. So what about pulling that contact? number and calling that person and saying, hey, you know what? Today, um, I heard you're, you, you told me you're going to go to the grocery store today. Can you go and pick up my groceries and drop them off at the front porch for me? Or maybe, hey, um, can you help me 
pay some of my, or can you show me how to pay my bills online? Because right now during institutional isolation, maybe we can keep ourselves from going outside often. Maybe we can try to stay home a lot more. So reach out to a person that's tech savvy and that can show you how to pay for your bills online. That support is there because the best way to be an effective caregiver is to care for yourself. Think about it. Um, if we don't receive the help, who's gonna give it to us? Also, if we don't focus on self-care, what's going to happen to us? What's gonna happen if we get sick? The primary caregiver gets sick. Who's gonna care for your loved one? Now, if both of you are sick, someone's gonna have to care for both of you. So the best way to be an effective caregiver is to care for yourself. And with this, we need to become comfortable with asking for help. That is caring for the caregiver. We need to put ourselves in the shoes of our loved one. Try to understand what they're going through. Try to take in some research, some knowledge, some information on what they're going through. More, more than likely, you understand what they're going through. Or you may have, might have seen the same, a similar situation with other with um, your loved ones or other friends. But asking for help is important. And also, if you know another individual, another caregiver or a friend or loved one that's going through similar situations as you are, or maybe not necessarily going through the same situation, because we know that every single person is living a different life and every situation is different. But if you know that they're a caregiver or maybe not necessarily caring for um, a, log, a loved one that has um, a disability or a physical impairment, but maybe just a mother caring for her children that's struggling, offer your help to um, that individual who needs your help. Because the best way that we can help our community out is by having that support within your community, having that reliance that you can have. And with this, um, a lot of people I grew up thinking, oh, nothing in this life is free. You need to work for everything. But surprise, surprise, I've learned that um, many other organizations I've worked for, and including Southern Caregiver Resource Center, that there's a lot of programs, like the one here at Myotonic Dystrophy that, that Leah mentioned, there's many, many programs um, and free resources that you can use. So why not take some of these free resources? That's part of receiving help, right? So now I wanna talk about the free resources that Southern Caregiver Resource Center offers. Um, again, we are the leading nonprofit organization that offers free resources to family caregivers within the San Diego County. We have a variety of resources that may be applicable to you that you may need, or maybe you may need just a few. We have family consultation and a case manager that can talk to you and assess your caring, caregiving situation because it may be very different from the previous person that they met with. Depending on your caregiving situation, this family consultant will connect you to some of these resources, maybe all of them, or maybe just a few. Um, one of these resources is specialized information, short-term counseling. Sometimes our caregivers need that one hour break to talk to a counselor, to get some advice on what they can do, to get some advice on how to focus on self-care. We can offer this for free. We also have a very, very popular one. We have legal and financial consultation. We are very fortunate to partner with several um, lawyers and attorneys that can help our caregivers with their legal situation for free. So if you're interested in any of these, please contact me at the end of the presentation. Um, I will be providing the information of the organization at the end of the presentation as well. Another popular resource that we offer at SERC is that we offer respite care. Um, now, if you don't know what respite care is, respite care is temporary, a temporary break for the caregiver from their caregiving duties. So we do this for um, absolutely free. Right now, we have a very, very large budget for respite care. So if you're interested, be sure to connect with us. Um, give me your contact information at the end of this presentation, and we can connect you with that. This is absolutely free. We also have Together Care, which is a form of respite care. 
The difference between respite care and together care is that together care is a program that was implemented um, about five months ago and was made possible by a grant that we got. Um, this is a cost sharing program for the caregiver to relieve them permanently from their caregiver duties. So if you're a caregiver or know of anyone that needs more of that permanent help, um, feel free to connect them with us. We also have support groups um, education and training, which is what I do as a community educator. As Leah said, I try to empower my community with knowledge on different caregiving topics that they request. I do various webinars and trainings that they may need. Um, before the pandemic, I used to travel all throughout San Diego County, but now I'm doing things virtually like everyone else. We offer employee resources, reach to caregivers, or Calma in Spanish, a program. We also offer Operation Family Caregiver. It's a program we have here at SCRC. We partnered with the Rosalind Carter Institute. Um, this is a military program for military families or military caregivers that are caring for their loved one. Um, so if you know anyone who's in the military or you yourself are in the military, this is a very, very great program that we have. Um, Feel free to connect with me at the end and I can get you connected to one of our representatives for OFC or Operation Family Caregiver Program. Again, these are all of our resources. There's many, many more coming. We've been around for more than 30 years and for some, these resources are not enough. For others, it's just way too many resources, but more are coming um, as time passes and progresses. And of course, stay connected with our Resources online. We have many bulletins that we've created specifically. This is one of our recent, most recent ones, our COVID-19 and caregivers. It's tips for our caregivers on how to prepare during this time. Um, it just, this is more personalized to what we are going through right now. And we also have our self-care while caregiving at home bulletin. Because as I mentioned in the beginning of our presentation, self-care is very, very important. Yes, it's okay to give all your love um, and time and affection to your care receiver, your loved one, but save some time for yourself as well. Remember, you need to care for yourself. So check out this bulletin on our website as well. We have our iCare portal. As I mentioned as well, we live in a very tech-savvy generation in which technology is being used a lot nowadays. So now we have to adapt as well. Our iCare portal is essentially all of our services online. So in our iCare portal, you can watch our live stream classes. Next, what's the caregiving topics? They're recorded once a month live on Facebook and YouTube in their one hour. But if you find yourself that you don't have one hour of your time to watch this video, we also have our one minute tip videos. That's what I always tell my caregivers. If you have one minute of your time to educate yourself a little bit, to get a little bit of that power, then watch a one minute quick, um, one minute quick tip video to learn about the highlights from that caregiving topic. We also have our podcast. We tune in with SERC staff, caregivers, um, professionals to talk about different caregiving topics, and these are recorded once a month as well. Um, we have our online live stream classes, our webinars, our trainings, everything is done virtually right now as well. So check out our iCare portal on our website as well. Now I do want to mention, as Leah stated in the beginning as she was doing my introduction, we, SERC, is the leading nonprofit that offers free resources to family caregivers in the state of California. So what we do is that <laughs> all of these resources are for our family caregivers, but if you're located out of the state of California, you can still access our resources online. So you can watch our live stream classes, our trainings online as well. Um, there's a, 10 other caregiver resource centers located in the state of California as well that can help you. If you're, um, again, located outside of the state of California, you can still connect to our services virtually. We have staff members that are on the phone and on our, on our phone line 24-7 most of the time, um, and they can help you um, with any of the questions that you may need, and they can connect you with 
other organizations if you may like that as well. We're always here to help. And of course, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. This is just a way to stay connected with our services, stay connected with the latest news, and stay connected with some of the information that we're, we present to our caregivers through the form of the bulletins or electronic flyers. So feel free to follow us. Our website is www.caregivercenter.org. But if you're interested in learning more about the other caregiver centers in California, the link to that is www.caregivercalifornia.org. Again, the link to learn more about the other caregiver centers in California is www.caregivercalifornia.org. And Caregiver California is all together. Org. This is our contact information. Right now, the main phone line that we are using is provided at the bottom, right after the 800-827-1800. Feel free to connect with us at 800-827-1008. That's our main phone line right now. Check out our website. If you have any questions, I will be taking some right now. Feel free to connect up to our services. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Valeria. That was really great. We have really, really great information. And thank you so much for reviewing the um, other centers outside of Cal uh, within California. But also, um, just a reminder to everyone: I will be, we will be emailing out this recording with the slides, so um, you have access to the different websites that Valeria mentioned, um, and you can use them at your. Well, we. Need questions that have come in, Valeria. Uh, you mentioned you know you have some resources about caregiving and COVID nineteen. Is there anything that caregivers should be considerable considering specifically right now? You know, I know you know given that everyone's at home, like what are some of the top things to think about with caring for the caregiver during COVID nineteen? Mm, that's an excellent question, Mia. So the biggest thing that we are pushing out right now as a caregiver resource center, and um, along with the other ten caregiver resource centers in California is that we're really, really pushing self-care right now because during this social isolation, some of us may not, um, if you're a part-time caregiver and now you need to step onto the role of being a full-time caregiver, some of us may not be 100% used to being with our loved one 24-7 indoors at all times. So incorporating self-care during this period of time and social isolation is very important. Uh, we offer a variety of different ideas and tips to how to stay busy and entertained indoors right now without having to go outside. Um, we also, I would say, is to be aware of your surroundings and um, be aware of what's going on. If you have to go to the grocery store, we, which I know that I do at some point in time, um, then maybe uh, feel free to ask for help and maybe contact your neighbor, contact an individual who can um, watch your loved one while you're gone. And of course, remember to take your hand sanitizer and face mask, um, but try to limit yourselves from going outdoors, especially because your loved one is um, an immune compromised individual that can get sick. So just be mindful when you do have to go out. Thank you, Leah. Sure, thank you. Um, one of our uh, attendees was asking as well about some of the resources that your center provides. Specifically, you, do you does your center help navigate um, like hiring caregivers and kind of all of that goes into getting additional care at home? Can you talk a little bit mm -hmm. about those services? Mm -hmm. So initially before COVID-19, that would go more along with our respite care program, which is free. Um, before it, all of this occurred, um, what the respite care program was initially intended to do is that if you needed to take a break or if you needed to go to a class or you simply just had to go to work and couldn't care for your loved one, what we would do is that we partner with professional caregivers that have been background checked and fingerprint printed. <laughs> and, um, that, that background check is done thoroughly. We know that your loved one will be in good hands. Um, what would happen is that during that period of time, we would send this caregiver to care for your loved one for that period of time. So it could be an hour, five hours, it could be a day. But the catch is, and the thing is that, that we want our caregivers to understand is that respite care, it was and is temporary. 
So we can't send or we couldn't send that professional caregiver to your home every single day, every single week. That's why it's temporary. We're here to support you temporary. So now at COVID-19 occurred, and now that we have to do those social isolation, we can't send, we cannot send a caregiver into your home. So we have made some adaptations um, to which we can use the budget for respite care because again, it's very, very, very large. Um, so if you need help paying for certain things, certain medications, um, you can contact one of us and we will connect you to a representative that handles um, the respite care budget and we will connect you with a family consultant to assess your situation. And depending on what kind of help you need, um, we can help you budget with that. Um, but again, maybe we just need to be contacted and we need to assess your situation because of course every situation is different. Um, but we know we don't send any caregivers into people's homes anymore because we are trying to practice a social distancing and for um, your loved one's personal health as well. We, we're not um, trying to put your loved one's health at risk, but we are here to help you financially with the rest of care. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. From my experience working with um, this community, I find that a lot of, of the community members don't really understand what a support group is or maybe what would mm -hmm. go on. Would you mind telling a little bit about what a caregiver support group looks like at the center mm -hmm. or in general? Yes, of course. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so what we our support groups here at Southern Caregiver Resource Center are always facilitated by a master's level clinician. Um, a support group essentially consists of having individuals in a room with you um, to talk about your caregiving experiences. Sometimes as caregivers, I know that this happens with me, um, my siblings can't, if they're not the caregivers or full-time caregivers, or if they're not with my loved one all the time, they may not necessarily understand what I'm going through as a caregiver. And this goes hand in hand with our friends as well. And um, um, for connections, they may not know why you're calling off work, or they may not know why you're so moody or agitated at times. So in the support groups, you'll be in a room with individuals that may more than likely be going through the same situation as you, you are. Um, so you can talk about your experiences, you can take in some recommendations and tips that maybe you didn't think about before. Um, you can express to them your concerns or maybe your excitements, your new news, um, your great news, and just have an hour of your time to have that me time that you need that you may not be getting so that's what the support groups are and it's just a safe zone to talk to other individuals and other caregivers um, who may need your help because you're there to help them out and um, they're there to help you out too so that's what a support group is um, here at SERC we have them all throughout San Diego County and the other caregiver resource centers have them as well we um, specifically here in the southern area, we have them in both English and Spanish in different kinds of um, areas all throughout San Diego County. So it's really great and our caregivers love it. Something that I encourage everyone to take um, advantage of. You never know if you don't try it, if you like it. So yes, thank you, Leah, for asking that question. Sure. Um, and I know that at certain times in for people with myotonic dystrophy, there might become a time where they're not able to live at home anymore because of their mm -hmm. functional or you know physical limitations. Does your center or affiliate centers provide counseling and referral services to placement and um, in residential sort of centers in the community that people can live? Yes, of course. So we partner with different caregiving um, homes and organizations. Um, again, all of these organizations have been checked out by us. We personally go and see them, um, see what their environment is like. Um, so your loved one will feel, feel comfortable in. Um, depending on your situation, if your loved one does need to be placed in a home, we will connect you to one of our um, these organizations that we have. I personally, I've gone worthy to be the primary caregiver of County, and they're fantastic. Um, one of them, and specifically um, for those of you who aren't located in San Diego or in the state of California, one of them is um, called the Glenners Foundation. And what I love about this one, I don't need, mean to point this one out, but what stands out about this one is that 
the entire theme of the um, once you step into the building is the 60s. Um, so it kind of, kind of takes um, your loved one into a different world. Um, then they have a hair salon, they have a kitchen to, to if your loved one is there, it still kind of has that independent, they can cook, supervise, um, they can paint and have some of that time that they may need um, to entertain themselves and to be well in that um, organization. But again, for the Together Care program, if you do need to place your loved one into a home, so to get this is more of a permanent, more of a permanent help to relieve you from your caregiving responsibilities. Um, the Together Care program will help you cover. Um, it's a cost sharing program, and it will help you cover for some of the costs, if not more than half of the cost, to place your loved one into a home. So that's another very popular one. It's called our Together Care program. Great, mm -hmm. and. Uh I know that in the state of California, we have a few different policies, paid family leave and other sorts of financial and um, time off policies and resources for people who need to take time off to care for a loved one. Does your mm -hmm. staff help educate or navigate people as to how to go about the process? Mm -hmm. So we can do trainings on that or we can meet our family consultants or our counselors can meet with them one on one. Um, we do know that some of our caregivers have to permanently leave their jobs because they're stepping onto their caregiving duties 24-7 and for a um, full-time caregiver, and they have to leave their jobs sometimes. So this is a case-by-case -case basis. Um, we don't do this specifically at Southern Caregiver Resource Center where we help you um, financially, but we will show you the steps and guide you to what you need to do. So one of the steps is that we connect you to the San Diego County and again, they assess your situation. And um, sometimes depending on the situation, they can actually um, help you financially while you are technically unemployed helping your loved one. Um, but then again, this is on a case by case basis and we would have to connect um, this specific caregiver to one of our spe specialists. Okay, great. And mm -hmm. I just want to echo that is if anyone on the call needs specific navigation or assistance with finding care in their area, if you please don't hesitate to reach out to the foundation and I can guide you in the right direction as to, to where to start if you need help applying for any leave programs, if you're in a position where you have to take time off now, um, you know, given COVID or even not, we're here to help you navigate these resources and, and systems. So that's all the questions I have for you, Valeria. Thank you so much for your time and for this presentation. I think it's been really helpful and hopefully it's given people on the lines um, a little bit of support and resources during this time. But um, I will share. Yeah, thank you so much. I, I did have one last um, comment that I forgot to mention. I didn't include it in the slide, uh, yeah. but we're actually going to be having a it, focusing on self-care again. We're actually going to be having a gardening um, webinar. Um, it's going to be on May 23. It's on a Friday. Yes, on a Friday. I'm just double checking here. Uh, May 22nd, I'm sorry, on a Friday. And what this is, is that it's a gardening workshop that focuses on self-care. So if you, you're located within the San Diego County, um, we will be providing free gardening tools, the soil, the container, the herbs, the water, everything, everything that you need to do this gardening activity from your home. Um, so if you're interested, just um, provide me with your contact information or email, and I can contact you and um, register you to for the workshop. Because um, again, in order to participate in the workshop, we can either deliver personally this gardening equipment to your home, or depending on where you're in in the San Diego County, you can pick up these um, gardening tools at one of our nearest locations. Um, and this is something that we're doing, partner, partnering with one of our organizations. And it's a gardening workshop to relieve some stress and focus on self-care during this time. That's great. That's such a great idea. Wow. Um, would mm -hmm. love to um, I'll so send we have an expert talk about what you can do in your garden, how you can grow your own herbs, and how can you, you can incorporate your loved one, the care receiver, during different gardening activities, um, grow garden in your home with a pot, 
Um, and again, all of this will be provided, all of the guarding materials will be provided to our caregivers um, free of cost. So it's something great to take advantage of. Yeah, that's really, really excellent. That's, that's a, such a great idea. Um, well, again, thank you so much, Larry, for all this information. And um, as I said, I'll email out all of this, um, the recording and the slides later this afternoon, as well as the contact information for Valeria and for the center. So if you have any further questions, you can reach out to them directly. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. And hope everybody has a great rest of their day and a great weekend. Talk to you soon.